All right, so we're back a little early than expected. That's because we've had some some major news, some major drops, right? So it appears that Don Landy has finally resurfaced in Tape Op magazine. So I got a link uh, last night from from Plexi Dust for the for the article, which was a two part thing, and uh, went through it and stayed up all night thinking about it and reading it and rereading it, and. Uh, it's at first glance, it may not be as impressive of a reveal as we all hoped, but once you sort of read it a couple of times and really look into what what you can derive from what he was saying, there's there's a lot of gold in in what Don was talking about. So there's some there's some things I think that we can we could start to apply. So I wanted to go through some of the things because it's, you know, you can't just let this go by without it being marked with a video. So I'm going to go through um, some of the nuggets that I pulled out of the article. <clears throat> so the first one was revolving around the reverb on those albums. So we have from the article, at one time or another, I'm sure we used every reverb system that Sunset had for Van Halen. But generally it was a Studio One live chamber or the Spring reverb in Studio Two. So those are in the Sunset Sound uh, plugin from IK Multimedia too. So the AKG. I liked the sound of that AKG spring tank, but I was like, there's no way they were using that, right? Because it's always been, the dogma is, uh, you know, the chamber or EMT dogma. So anyway, um, but generally he said it was the Studio One live chamber or the spring reverb in Studio Two. If possible, I used the chamber in Stu Sunset One so that was his favorite. He liked that the best. Um, it's unique, he says. The second best, which is more of a standard chamber, was for Studio 2. Um, there was also an AKG BX20 Spring. Um, so he has that going on. And he believes that that was, um, you know, a perfection of Spring Reverb. Like he says, it wasn't like the Fender spring reverb where you kick your amp and it goes boing, 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 and sounds like thunder it's not they were they made a really cool um worked out all the bugs and really made it sound lush and less goofy sounding all right so um other um talking about what another band recording another band which may be applicable because obviously uh people tend to do the same things right so they use their techniques uh when playing when they played acoustic guitar referring to this band i like to use the neumann U87s on their amps, probably a C37A uh, or an SM57, but sometimes the U87 or Sennheiser MD421. So the 421, I think, was what was used on Montrose. So that's interesting, right? This um, there's a 421 somewhere in here. It's kind of square. <laughs> anyway, um, that's so that's cool. Now. These are just random nuggets I'm pulling out and we're, we could talk more in depth about everything, but I had to bring this out. So the next thing would be revolving around Van Halen 2, that album. And he's talking about uh, somebody get me a doctor. So he's, I don't think there was much room sound on doctor. It's probably delays along with Westlake's EMT 140 plate. So that's crazy, right? So to me, Van Halen 2 sounds like room mics everywhere. Right? It's very hollow sounding, but not using it and obviously using delays. That's another revelation as well, is the application of different types of delays in stereo that can sound like reverb or sound better than reverb. So that's pretty cool. And then Westlake's EMT. We got to look into that a little more. Um, all right. On Everybody Wants Some, this is the question um, being, uh, being posed to Landy. Uh, and this was um, Renoff, right? Um, on Everybody Wants Him, once again, it sounds like Ed was playing at an ear-bleeding volume. How did he play in the studio? Or how loud did he play in the studio? Landy's response, not loud at all. Ed's was the quietest Marshall I ever heard. <laughs> right? That's kind of interesting, right? Why was it so quiet? Um he wasn't telling any, everybody that he was using the Variac on his Marshall at 85 instead of 120. That was one of the key reasons he got that sound. So that's one of the key reasons. Agreed. But obviously, we've I've, I've, I've proved it to myself. Obviously, you can't be here in the rooms or whatever to know. 
but a regular super lead plexi down at 85 volts is still going to make your head ring. <laughs> it's going to be stupid loud, right? It, I mean, at a certain point, we could talk about the physics of, of loudness, right? And decibels and how they, um, you know, how each decibel level going up becomes an order of magnitude. We could talk about what creates the illusion of loudness, of something being very loud, which has to do with decibel peaks, but more importantly, decibel duration. How long it can hold the peaks is how we determine how things are loud. You can have short bursts of high energy that are not going to appear to your mind or to yourself to be as loud as the same decibel energy, but for a longer duration, a flatter peak, right? That also is like we could talk about how, you know, explosive sounds are formed, right? Like what is an explosion? An explosion is basically an extremely high peak with a very short duration. That's what makes things sound explosive. So that's also, we could go into uh, its application in guitar amps, where if you have something that's too compressed in terms of too many gain stages, where we talked about how it can hold the signal above the line of clipping for a very long time, it loses dynamics. Something that can make excursions in and out of the line sort of of uh, where, of headroom, right? Where the, the clipping line, something that can make excursions in and out of that becomes dynamic and punchy, what we call punchy or explosive. So if you want something to sound like, you know, the, the, the chord or rather the note drops on, you know, eruption where it's like, bah, 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 and it just sounds like bombs going off. That's not a high gain in a sense, long duration. That's a quick thing, high peak and then shut down. So let's let's keep going from there. Um, so that was interesting. A very quiet Marshall. Um, all right. Let's see. When you recorded Sunday afternoon in the park, something unexpected happened when Ed and Al cut the track in Studio Two. So obviously that's you know we're talking about that really weird electro harmonics little you know. I don't even know what it was made out of. It was like you know a kitty keyboard that you you know was sort of pressure sensitive plastic. Um, and Landy replies, yes, we maximize the microphonic nature of Ed's electroharmonics mini synth by having Ed play it while it rested on a baffle in front of Al's drums. Al's kick was keying the synth. So every time Al kicked this thing, this piece of crap synth got triggered in some way. He said it was bizarre. When Ed went to move it, I said, no, leave it there. So that's why you have that bow, 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 bow. That sound, there's a, there's a, you know, there's a triggering from the microphonic nature or somehow something about the circuit in that keyboard was able to, to uh, react to the sound pressure of low frequencies like a kick. So now we have a mind, like some of these things give you a, a window into his mind and how he worked and how he was creative and willing to take advantage of things that were happening around him that he could observe. So this is, I think, something that would be interesting in terms of trying to figure out what he did, right? Because you're going to think, well, it's formulaic. Okay, probably some of it's formulaic because he has a lot of experience and understands what has worked and what hasn't worked here and there throughout his career of working with so many different bands. But he's also not opposed to taking advantage of the unique properties of the situation that he's working in. If he notices something through observation, he takes advantage of it. And that's really the essence of like science, right? Is observation. If you can observe phenomenon and then harness it, you create inventions. And that's, that's what Landy was so good at. So let's, let's move on. Um, another one that's interesting with unchained. Did you add the flanger through the board or did Ed do that with a pedal? He says that was all Ed. I'm st that blows my mind. When they came back to hear the final take, I asked him about the pitch on the opening riff, but as he goes a little sharp, he said, Oh, that's fine. I would probably have pursued it further with anybody else, but his tuning and pitch were unsurpassed. But when I hear it now, it still sounds sharp. Okay. I always thought, that if you can, if you're a guitar, let's say if you have a, a band and you're, you're the lead guitar player, if you're playing a little bit up, a little sharp of where the rest of the band is, it can add something to it, like a, a, an excitement or an urgency. 
So how your relative tunings work can influence the perception of excitement or of drowsiness. And obviously, Unchained comes off pretty exciting, right? So that may be part of it. I don't know. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see what else we got. So he goes in there and talks about some of the equipment that he helped Ed procure for 5150, which is interesting, right? So they go through the board, which we know something about. Um, now, I, I, a couple of days ago, I was once again looking at the board that was in 5150 at the time 1984 was recorded. It was sold off to a guy in Toronto who has like a sort of a, a historical studio set up in his back lot, so to speak, right? So he's a pretty pretty well-to-do individual who has a passion for this sort of thing and in recording studios and has bought a lot of very famous consoles that were used on a lot of famous recordings, including this particular board, which came originally from... Um, where did it come from? Where did it come from? Western? It came from one from one of the rooms in LA. Yeah, Western Studio. So um, now that brings us back to, um, you know, the pictures again that are available online when because right now a couple of these other channel strips were are being sold on Reverb currently and they have pictures of them and the interior gut shots. And you can see what they're made of and they're very interesting sort of um boards right they're very interesting uh signal chains or channel strips there's a mic preamp then you have a eq section you have a compressor you have a send and return to go out to reverbs now the eqs are really interesting they're actually uh ic and or rather um yeah inductive capacitive um lc rather networks so they have a little little air core uh, uh, inductor in there that has multiple taps on there which then go to you know another network of resistors capacitors and what have you to create the notches for where you want to emphasize the frequency so that's similar to what you would get in you know some of the um, api stuff but it's an inductive way of or an inductor used in the uh the tone controls which is really cool a tank filter you might call it also the compressors in that board so the compressors you're looking at them and they've got old optoelectrics in them so it was an optical compressor that was on those boards and the opticals looked something like the ones you also would find in you know like the uh the um compander units like compressor expander units, but the compressor section of wireless units, things like that. So it was a pretty standard uh, compressor unit, but it was a little optical compressor. It wasn't like an FET like you have in the 1176, but was closer to something like the LAs, right? Which were optical compressors, but not like an LA-2A, which has like the big optical unit. I got to open one of these up and see what's in there. If it's like the little mini, <laughs> you know, almost like an LDR in there you know, light dependent resistor. Um, but that's how they function on that. So that's interesting. And then they had a send and return to go to the reverb, which we then learned would be the EMT. So that's pretty cool. So maybe that, that big uh, pad or that big uh, lexicon unit in his rack is, um, could be delay or it could be a controller for the plate. I don't think they were that advanced at that point, but maybe they were upfitted. I don't know, with, with you know, different frequency notchings and all that kind of stuff, but interesting stuff there. Um, let's go on. Uh, let's see. It also says they had the jump track before Van Halen's US or US Festival appearance. So they were doing recording and had probably a lot of that work in the can for that US Festival. So the US Festival may give us a key as to what his gear sounded like at the time, possibly. I'm still of the opinion that, you know, if it wasn't that day, he could have changed it the following day and, you know, moved away from the out from the uh, sound that he used to record with on 1984. Um, because recording and live are two very different things, two different animals that have to be approached in different ways. So um, like talking with like with Brad Whitford from Aerosmith, who I've worked with, obviously, and have talked with a bunch. He always loved the sound of, you know, champs, super champs, little champs, little amps for recording. And when they would do a lot of recording, they would use small amps, but live, they would always go back to the Marshalls. Now, that's not to say that they didn't use Marshalls recording too and big amps, but the little amps was like what they really liked for to get on tape. So anyway, you know, 
neither here nor there, things can change. Recording versus live doesn't mean that they have to run concurrently. They could, but they don't have to necessarily. Um, all right. Uh, another interesting part. At, Ed, at 51 to 50, did Ed do his solos in the control room or out in the studio? So if he played this solo live with the rest of the band, he played in the studio. For overdubs, he nearly always played in the control room. So that once again opens up a whole another set of possibilities as to the signal chain of his guitar, but you're obviously going to be going through a pass through, right? Through from the control room out to the live room to the amplifier. It eliminates the possibility of wireless units probably. It's going to lead to longer cable lengths. You may want to go into something before you go out to the control room. You may want to do that. That's not like that. That hasn't been done before. So you would maybe plug into the console. The console will go to the pass through out of the control room into the live room into the amp. And then everything will come back in through the pass through and into the control room once again. And the pass through is just like a, it's a control panel that's, it's in the wall that separates the control room from the live rooms, which will have, you know, a patch bay in them, so to speak, an ability to connect you know, microphones or quarter inches, XLRs, whatever it would be, power that you would need in the live room, but don't want to leave the door cracked open to run the cables through the crack in the door, right? So it opens up a lot of possibilities. Um, there's a few other things that were in there, which I didn't notate, but I'm just going like from memory. Um, and probably like the biggest one and it is, is, is this, um, now, all right, so this is Landy's just talking about a, a, an incident where he had a eureka moment in the studio with another individual with, with two turntables and, uh, you know, a couple of different amplifiers and coming to, a, you know, a eureka moment. So it says, I would play him the same record by putting the two copies on both turntables. All right, so he's got he's got a record, a vinyl, and in that room they have two turntables. And this record is identical and one on each table. And he says he would switch back and forth between the two, you know, kind of like two turntables and a microphone left, right, left, right, right? Um, I'd switch back and forth. I pointed out to him which one sounded better. He would say, well, that's just the preamp or something else. Well, one time I accidentally turned them both on. The two needles were in exactly the same spot on the records and it generated a perfect slow flanging. The two machines were off, were off speed ever so slightly and you would hear whoosh, just like a comb filter. That's crazy. Just like a comb filter going through the music. I said, that's how they do it. That was his eureka moment. That was all I needed to know. From then on, I did the same thing with tape machines, amplifiers, and oscillators to get them to run at slightly different speeds. So now an oscillator, all right. So you definitely hear comb filtering on these albums, right? You definitely hear it. It's a very complex kind of sound. It's a little chorusy, a little flangy. It's a little phasey. It's something that you can't duplicate very easily without combining signals that are sort of out of phase with one another or different time signatures, right? So these two tape machines, he devised, I, I get from this that he devised, because in other parts of this article, he realized that he, he was an engineer. I mean, beyond just recording, that he grew up, you know, building radios and, stereos and amplifiers and messing with circuits and sniffing solder, you know, since he was a little kid. And I can totally get along with that, right? So he had a working knowledge of electronics. His father was an electrical engineer trained in the greed. So he obviously had somebody to guide him at, at a young age to, to, to be able to accomplish things with electronics. So what I get from this is that he was building oscillators to control the speeds of tape machines and other types of gear to make them warble. Now, an oscillator is just like a, um, it's a, it's a kind of a feedback network 
that has a controlled uh, amount of feedback in time, which is a lot, which allows you to vary a voltage up and down in a very smooth, repeatable time signature, like up, down, up, down. And if you vary certain parts inside the oscillator circuit, you could get it to speed up, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, or slow down, right? And oscillators are what you would use in Fender amplifiers to create tremolo, right? So in a, in a, in a, the way a Fender amps tremolo works, right? The bup, 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 bup. How that actually works is you have an oscillator, which is setting a voltage swing back and forth, which is feeding a opto isolator, an LDR resistor to make it open and close. And to open and close, it needs voltage. So as the voltage rises, it begins to open. And as the voltage closes, it begins to close or as the voltage drops, rather, it begins to close. So as you turn the speed up, it makes it open and close faster. And as you turn the speed of the oscillator down, the voltage swing slows down and the oscillator is able to control the resistor to make it go slower, open and close. So we go from depending on the speed, right? So he made these little oscillators, I'm guessing in little boxes, and maybe could plug into things and vary voltages on tape decks. So this is probably explaining how we get these sort of like interesting flanges and sparkles and phases and just ear candy through the whole mix of these albums. Now, he related a couple of times where he used this. Now, particularly, there was uh, Listen to the Music by the Doobie Brothers. Now, there's a part in where there's a chorus which is sounds flanged out, and that was done with this technique. So he was using it for that. Um, I, I, that's what I'm hearing on Van Halen one is I think it's this and it's not only on the mix down because on listen to the music, you have it on the vocal track. You don't have it on everything. So he had the ability or, or would rig everything up in such a way where he could do it on a track probably, or just one part wherever he wanted. And then he could do it to the whole thing again to create just this interesting, um, you know, ear pleasing ear candy mix at the end of the day so this may not be you know this is just one trick there's probably a ton of them that you know and why would he give them away it wouldn't make sense because you give away your tricks you're kind of not needed anymore so he wouldn't necessarily give them all away but this is this is something else right there another interesting thing was so I, he was talking about china grove and that song has you know the bow 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 and there's an echo and the way that the guitar player originally did it was with an echoplex and landy said the echoplex was terrible and it was noisy and he didn't like him and that he added it in later with delays inside the control during mix and that's how they did it so if he hated that what did he think of ed's echoplex i don't know so anyway, you got to check this out. It's at the, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to um, put the link down in this or someone else put a link. I'm goofy. I may forget to do this, but Tape Op Magazine. And it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty cool. There's a lot. There's so much in this. A lot of funny stories. Jim Morrison trying to burn down <laughs> Sunset Sound. Eddie knocking on Landy's window at three in the morning trying to get him to go to the studio. Just crazy, you know, rock and roll typical nuttiness so yeah i just had to do a video real quick this is just you know it's like waiting the spaceship is landing and got to go to the window and look at it so anyway that's it i hope this didn't get too long but anyway we'll see you later i got to get back to messing with this stuff because i got a million ideas now all right so i'll see you